What's up, everybody? Welcome to Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. We got some great guests in the building. Steve, great Lemmy, guests. Great Kevin guests. Heffernan. Guys, how are you? Good. How are you? Good, man. Great. How are you? I feel like I'm Good blocking you. you out there. You know? Okay. <laughs> Just lean back. Yeah, you got this going. Anyway. I'm here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back here. You guys have your brand new show, Tacoma FD, coming yeah. out Thursday on True TV. First of all, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. We were just talking off camera. You guys really haven't done a lot of TV. And Steve, you were saying, like, True TV, you guys get all the publicity you need because it's not Netflix with a bunch of different shows. So what's it been like putting this whole thing together? Uh, it's been great since the beginning. I mean, when we uh, approached True about doing the show, we were pitching the idea to them. It became clear that they were going to be very, uh, just a very good place for, from a creative standpoint. And all the way through the process, they've uh, you know they've encouraged us to uh, to be as edgy and out there as we possibly can be. And then I mean they're really behind the show, so it's uh, we only have to compete with Impractical Jokers, right? That's a, if you that's look a on the network, it's there. all Impractical Jokers. We got to get a slot in there. <laughs> that's right. We get in there somewhere. And in fact, we're kind of on the Impractical Jokers sidecar. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's yeah. a good sidecar to be. It is. Oh, it's a great it sidecar. Yeah. yeah. So why Tacoma? How'd you guys come up with that? Uh, well, you know, when we were we were making this thing, we wanted to make this fire station comedy. Basically, it's Super Troopers in a fire station, right? right? So uh, the idea was when we did Super Troopers, the reason those cops had downtime to have fun was because they were on a remote stretch of highway, right? So what's the equivalent for a fire department? And we thought, oh, the rainiest city in mm. America. <laughs> why not put it there? And then it'll give these guys some downtime. So we. Decided Tacoma after in Tacoma we decided yeah yeah I think we were in Tacoma yeah you were in Tacoma we were in Tacoma we were, we were talking about Seattle as a spot for this and we're like and we were sitting in Tacoma we we're like Seattle's so obvious mm. let's oh, Shonda Rhimes is like I'm sorry what did you just say <laughs> <laughs> but we were yeah we were in Tacoma we were like let's do it right here in Tacoma it also has a tough sound it's Tacoma. Tacoma yeah and there's like they've got a thing there called the aroma of Tacoma oh <laughs> which we also thought could uh, eventually you know Good plan, seep into an episode yeah, yeah. pun intended. <laughs> Well, even like Super Troopers, I mean, you guys are doing Vermont. It's not like you're doing, you know, Boston or something like that. Yeah. You kind of go for the more Now all the people audience. in Vermont are like, what did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not that big of a deal. Yeah, there's only 100 people there. So it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about you basically niche down to a very specific area as opposed to going big city. It's yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely. But I think also that's part of the thing of like it's every place right. in the sense of, you know, people can watch it and... It's something that they can relate to, and it's not like hey, we're in the big city or whatever, you know. So I think that's part of it. I also think there's like an underdog feel to it, which we have always liked. Um, you guys champion the underdog. Yeah. Movie. Well, you know, because our our philosophy has never been to be the aggressor in any mm -hmm. situation. You know, we're always we're, we try to make it so that we're a group of friends that you want to hang out with, and unless you mess with us, we're not gonna like just pick on people for no reason. Right. And so, you know, like certainly when we're in Seattle, they're always making fun of the Tacomaners. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> you know, if you're a Tacomaner, we know they're like, yeah, the Seattle guy. So, like, that's, that to us is a great place to start. Right, there's great content with <laughs> yeah. that. So yeah. Like, yeah. So why don't we wind it back? I mean, we know you guys uh, did everything together in college, but even before then, you know, who were your people that you would like to listen to growing up, watch growing up? Kevin, let's start with you. Yeah, well, we watched uh, a lot of the same stuff. I mean, the kind of early Saturday Night Live stuff, mm -hmm. Steve Martin. Uh, the John Landis movies, you know, like Animal House yep. and Blues Brothers and stuff like that. I think we were the ones when we were kids that we watched. We had, I mean, we had great stuff to watch. We had Monty Python. Mm -hmm. We had uh, Cheech and Chong. Right. Um, there's so many. There's so many more than that that we're that we're already forgetting. But like, I, I think we grew up in the golden age of comedy films. And now we're living in the golden age of comedy television. Ooh, I see Are what we? you did there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, dude. I'm rolling today. Yeah, you're good. You're good. So you guys get the Colgate. Take me back to the first time all you guys meet, and when did you realize this would be something that would help <laughs> oh, guide man. the rest of your lives? Uh, I hated this he guy. He hated right? me. I didn't like him when we he first hated met. Me. You know uh, what? And therefore, I didn't like him. Was this freshman year? Or how old it was. Uh, well, he was a freshman. I was a sophomore, okay. and I was in a fraternity, and he was pledging that, or he was trying to join the fraternity. And so, uh, on the weekends, we have these parties. And people will come to this fraternity house, and it's cold, upstate New York. Yep. So they take off their winter coats and they throw them on a big pile on the floor uh, during the party. And then after the party, you take your coat and you go home. Mm -hmm. So uh, after this party one night, I went to get my coat, and it wasn't in the pile. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. And so I was like, ah, somebody stole my coat. And I went for like two weeks, no winter coat, in upstate New York. That it must sucked. have been brutal. It sucked, right? So new party comes up. I go, and I look in the pile, and there's my coat. I find my coat in the pile. And I pick it up. And I reach into the pocket, and the thief who stole my coat left his college ID in the pocket <laughs> of the coat. And I pull it out and it says Steve Lemmy on it. Mm. And I was like, who is this guy, Steve Lemmy? I went and I found him like, yeah. on the dance floor or yeah, whatever he was. Busting a move. Busting a move. <laughs> and I was like, hey, man, you stole my coat. 
He goes, no, I didn't. I said, I found your ID in it. And he goes, holy crap, the guy who stole your coat must have stole my ID. <laughs> That's right. I'm clever like mm, that. I'm clever like on that. Your feet. Well, That's now right. think about it from my perspective, sure. okay? I'm at this fraternity party, yep. and all the freshmen live up on this hill known as Cardiac Hill. Mm. It's a gigantic hill at the Colgate <laughs> University campus. All of a sudden, it starts snowing. I need a coat to get home with. You just I start rummaging. Well, everybody did it. Everybody yeah, did it. They're like, "That's his excuse." You just got caught too. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get caught. <laughs> <laughs> so the other Steve. I, I started rummaging through the coats, and I came across this overcoat. I put it on me, and it like wrapped around me like three <laughs> times. I was like a burrito. <laughs> You're like, I am going to be nice and warm. I was like, this going is fantastic. Coat. And I reached into the pocket, and there's a, a jumbo Snickers bar. Seriously? <laughs> Unopened. I, I for energy. Found there a winner. Go. Found a winner there. Like, so, this is the coat. Oh, yeah. yeah. I walked up Cardiac Hill, stopped a few times to eat my deluxe gigantic Snickers. And then, yeah, I, you know, I had been partying hard. I forgot where I got the coat. Mm. You know, like, so, throw it on my own pile. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, and, and then uh, we, we started. Jay liked me. Yep. Jay Shaner Secker liked me. He was also a sophomore. So when I pledged the house, I know that Kevin was speaking against me. Mm. And I spoke against him for the comedy group, too. I was like, really? I don't want the, he's yeah. a coat thief. Yeah, <laughs> he's I, a the coat thief. I auditioned for him and, and Jay. <laughs> and, but, you know, listen, my audition was so good yeah. that uh, Jay... You couldn't say no. That's right. Well, I think Jay convinced him. He was like, you know, we'll get him to play like a thief. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yeah, I know a thing or two. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, and yeah. then we were in a sketch. We wrote a sketch together uh, where I'm Socrates and he's Plato. Mm. <laughs> and I'm his tutor. It's college days, you yep. know what I mean? Smart. Yeah, intellectual yeah, types. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, this, and the sketch was one of the, the favorites of the show. Yeah. And then we did a second run of, of a show at Colgate and we did a sequel to the sketch. Oh, wow. And by that time, I thought anyway that Kevin and I were good friends. But I found out he didn't like me for like another five years. <laughs> Five years? Yeah, it took a while. So when did it finally tip over where you're like, this guy's all right? Um, I think it was when we were doing shows in New York City and um, he started like pulling his own weight. Mm. You know what I mean? He started doing his own work for the group. What so. are you talking about? Then I, I half wrote that Socrates and Plato <laughs> sketch. <laughs> Is that true? You mentioned the times in New York, like, take me back there. It must have been so much fun just figuring things out, you know, playing together. What do you remember most? Yeah, I mean, that was a blast. We, when we graduated from Colgate, we came here and we just did, we reformed the group and just did kind of shows mm -hmm. at, you know, different theaters and different uh, comedy clubs and things like that. And um, that yeah. was just, it was like... Uh, the main was the main one was the duplex. Okay. Yeah, it was, right. it's it was a on 7th Ave. Yeah. yeah, Sheridan Square. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, they were the only place that would take us. And they're kind of like, they're, it's, it's a gay cabaret club. Mm -hmm. And I think that they took us because they were like... Eight guys in the group, <laughs> <laughs> and they thought like, they were getting. Play well for audience. Yeah. yeah, they were the only place that would take us, and, uh, and we would show these videos. We would show, you know, we started making videos mm -hmm. back then. But back then, you made them on like a big. Yeah, what were you guys camera. using to make? And then you had a TV then. like this, yeah. but it was a tube TV, right, so it was right. about three thousand pounds. Yeah, it had that big base yeah. on the ground. Yeah, there. and yeah. so we would roll. The TV down Seventh yeah, Avenue. Well, well, first we on a tray. We carry it down. They, they, uh, he and Jay lived in a, in a townhouse on Bleecker Street. Okay. We'd carry it down the, like four <laughs> or five <laughs> flights yeah, of right. stairs. <laughs> this is a rock paper scissors turning yeah. every time. Right. Then yeah, roll it on the tray yeah. and then carry it up and then bring carry it up the two fl the two flights at the duplex. That's the next level commitment. Yeah. Right now you don't do that stuff. No. You know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah. Now you can carry this nice flat screen TV around easily. Yeah. <laughs> but but on any given night, like uh, down there in. in uh, in the village, you could see us, you know, <laughs> after the show, like, just who are these stealing guys? the TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but no, that's that. That so like so. I think they gave us the duplex. Gave us what was it three three Mondays? Is that what we saw? Yeah, Monday nights. Mm -hmm. Good night. And uh, <laughs> we did our first show. And, you know, we were like 21, 22 yeah. years old. All of our we had a few generations of uh, of college graduates. Right. And that first show, I mean, that, that it was like a what like an 80 seat room or yeah. 50 seat room or mm -hmm. something like that. Yep. We packed the place, and you know they just drank that place out of beer. And at the end of the show, the place was covered with empty beer bottles. And they realized, you know, capitalism kicked in. They were like, "Hey, we got something here." And so they extended <laughs> immediately after the first show. They extended us to two shows a week, oh, wow. Monday and Wednesday, I right. believe. Mm -hmm. And then after the second show, uh, they gave us a uh, a summer run or, or a weekend run. Mm -hmm. They they put well, us now on the weekend. Big time. That's the next step. That's right. Well, we were just selling it. All our friends would just come and like they'd seen the show like five times. Right, and they're in for a good laugh. They're hanging out. They're having some drinks. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah, we should go back there. Let them do let them do a show there. Have you guys yeah. been back? We uh, drove by there yesterday. Yes. We we're looking for our, our favorite pizza and uh, and gyro places. Yeah, Caravas. It was across <laughs> the street. It was across the street gone. from the duplex. Yeah. Sadly, 
we were like looking at the women like, oh, where's Krav? Is Krav so <laughs> Oh no, it's a, yeah, it's a delicatessen now. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, what is Krav now? I'm sure it's yeah. oh, the it's a flower shop oh, and a man. delicatessen. Yeah. You guys should do a show at the duplex again. I you know. It. We drove by, first we saw the Village Vanguard. We had done a show there. Mm -hmm. Yep. But then the duplex was really, we did, we did I think two years at the duplex. Okay. Yeah. And there's that whole area of like, don't tell mamas and like mm. 88 Grove, anyway. I don't know if they exist anymore though. They may not. Yeah, that's a good yes. question. Yeah. So, what's the next step from the duplex to you guys doing movies? You know, what are the, or what are you still doing to kind of take things forward? Well, we just keep, we kept making, you know, videos that we showed during our show, and then the idea was, you know, at that time it was kind of this really, there was a kind of a boom of, of the independent film things. Mm -hmm. It was when Richard Linklater and Kevin Smith mm -hmm. and all those guys were making independent films. And we were kind of got the bug that hey we can we can try that. Yeah, for like, you know, you're hearing about like Robert Rodriguez. He made a mariachi for like ten grand, mm. and Kevin Smith made Clerks for like forty a, grand. Or yeah, I don't know yeah. what it was. Yeah. And so we decided to do that, and um, we uh, put together about two hundred fifty thousand bucks on credit cards, and then we went and shot our first movie, Puddle Cruiser. Wow. So that was kind of made us into you know move into the film world. What was the biggest challenge of Puddle Cruiser when you guys first started? We didn't even know anything technically. Like we didn't even know where to put the camera. <laughs> like put the camera here? Yeah, put the camera here. I'll How big was here. the crew at that point for that movie? Uh, it was pretty decent size. Yeah. I mean, the, well the funny thing is is that we so we, it takes place on a college campus. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, a collection of our our college stories and uh, we wanted to shoot it at Colgate University where we went, you know, because yeah. that's when we were writing it, that's what we were picturing. Oh, here's the mail room. It looks like this, right. you know. And uh, they were the ones who didn't want us to come. I think they thought mm -hmm. we were going to just say, like make a movie that Colgate is a big party school. <laughs> and so we tried all these other campuses. No one would let us uh, uh, shoot there. And, and it was the summertime. And finally, our friends just started faxing the dean. <laughs> faxing. <laughs> faxing. Old school. The okay. dean of the school and uh, saying, hey, you know, you're, you come to us when it's time to do some fundraising. Right. Now you've got these graduates who are trying to do something. Let's make this happen. Yeah. And so they, they let us shoot there over the summer. And uh, we wound up putting up the cast and the crew in our fraternity house. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gross. <laughs> but like, so it's, it's like... Stunk. Everybody fit in there too? Yeah. 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 It's a big house. Yeah, yeah. It's stunk and, oh, you know, man. there's like just gang showers <laughs> and... But it's like... Like, like it would be beds, uh, like it would be just like a slab of wood on a cinder bled, cinder, cinder block. Yeah. You know? But that was the thing though. It's like our director of photography was an o older gentleman, mm -hmm. a respectable fella. Right. So he's like, what the heck? Well, no, no. But we, but we thought... Let's give them the best bed in the house, which is the <laughs> bed on the cinder blocks. It's stable, you know. There's like there's no give on the, for the mattress. Yeah, yeah. Like this is a good room. Let's yeah. give this to him. And yeah. he, like, from his perspective, it was he walked in. Here's a, a flat piece of wood on four cinder blocks with a mattress, <laughs> and we're standing behind. Him like, what do you think? Like, this is the best one in the building. Yeah. yeah. Come on. How about uh -huh. it? Uh -huh. Yeah. Presidential suite. Yeah. That's really. Interesting. And then the gang showers. He had to like, you know. Get in the gang showers with us. We're like, what's up, dude? Like, <laughs> that probably wasn't in the initial pitch. <laughs> yeah, you were yeah. to be a part of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he walked off once or twice. He walked off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was uh, that was a challenge, and uh, you know, also the funny thing was there were no extras. Mm. We didn't really so have money to pay extras. Uh, nothing. nothing. It's, uh, we like to call it post-apocalyptic university. Because <laughs> like, I'd come out of a building after class. You know, like the, the class is let out. I'm the only person. Flip around, there's the girl that I'm dating. Mm -hmm. yeah. And She's the only person. there's no one on campus. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hot campus. Yeah, you guys were able to fake it enough where yeah. people probably aren't even thinking about that yeah. when they watch the movie. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. So you go from that to Super Troopers, and you're at Sundance in yeah. 01. And well, so, so, that, so that movie, Puddle Cruiser, got into Sundance, okay. but it didn't sell, right. which was kind of devastating for us, and we didn't really know what the next move was, mm. and uh, you know, we, we wound up getting George Clooney as an executive producer on Super Troopers. Really? There was, he, he had a girl who worked for him named Amy Cohen who wanted to produce a movie, and mm -hmm. he said, if you can find anything for less than five million bucks, I'll, I'll do it and she found the Super Troopers script. So with Clooney, we went around, not with him in the room, right. but uh, well, with the name attached yeah, yeah, yeah. to like the presidents of all the major yeah. studios, and they'd be like, okay, uh, how much do you guys want f to make this movie? We're like five million bucks, mm -hmm. and, and who's gonna act in it? It's us. <laughs> and who's directing it? Jay's like, it's me, and they're like, and is George gonna be in the movie? And the answer was no. Like, not like, exactly, <laughs> okay. no, but he's a part of it. Yeah, 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 and then they would say like, you know, we don't really get this project, This. Like this scene, w there are people just meowing on the page. It's just <laughs> like two pages of meowing. Like, we don't get that. Mm. And we're like, we think it's hysterical. But so everybody, trust us, there's an audience yeah. for this. Yeah, so everybody passed. Yeah. And then this uh, uh, a girl's, uh, there's this guy who, uh, his daughter went to Colgate. Okay. Pete Langell. 
and he retired from banking and wanted to get into independent filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, he asked his daughter, do you know anybody who does this? Because I'd like to ask them questions. And so she essentially referred them to us. And he sat down with our producer and said he had never even read a script before. Mm. And what did that look like? And so our producer gave him the Super Troopers uh, <laughs> script. And he it's quite an entry into the movie world. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, he read it and came back and was like, who's doing this? And Rich was, Perella was like, you can be doing it. And so yeah. uh, he wound up ultimately financing the film. Wow, that's a fascinating story yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then it got into Sundance. Yeah, so when you guys were at Sundance, I mean, you've, you've made this movie, you've been working towards this. I mean, that was before Sundance is like this really major thing at this yeah. point. So what yeah. was the coolest part of that experience? Kev? Well, I think the great thing was that um, we had never really screened it for an audience, you know? And so <clears throat> that opening scene in Super Troopers has become kind of iconic in the sense that this, the kind of stoners in the car mm -hmm. is, is something that people really love that scene. But we had no idea how it would play, you right. know? So, we literally walked off the plane with the film for the first time, and we walked into this midnight screening at Sundance. And we didn't, we had already, you know, essentially failed once at Sundance. We had yeah. brought a movie there mm -hmm. once and didn't sell. And so this was a kind of a nerve wracking We moment. were scared. Yeah. And so we brought it in, and we did a midnight screening in the big theater there, the Egyptian, I think it was. And, and uh, it was packed, and it played through the roof. Like just the first scene, people started laughing. And you're like, holy crap, holy crap. And then it ended up just playing really well. And we walked out of the theater, and we got you know, multiple offers from the movie, and so we sold it. We were the first film to sell that year. Oh, wow. And so it was a, a much better experience for us going the second time than mm. it was going the yeah, first time. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah which was great, because you know it was, it was the midnight series, which mm. means it's not in the competition. It's kind of like, <laughs> here, that's where the, the dirty ones are. <laughs> and, uh, you guys were able to stand out as a result. Well, we were, yeah. we were nervous about that. We were like, oh, okay, we're going back our second time, and we're in this midnight series. And then I think, ultimately what happened for a few years after that at least was that that midnight series became like actually a great place to showcase mm -hmm. like I think Napoleon Dynamite played mm -hmm. there oh, and a bunch of yeah. okay. bunch of films. You guys kind of started the trend with everything then? Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah, I think it may have been the first year that midnight thing so. Interesting. Yeah. So when did you guys realize this was going to be a big hit? I mean because box office you make 20 plus mil. Yeah. This is second bounce with VHS and DVD and on college campuses so when was like the first moment you were like this is actually going to be something here. It was, it was that. I mean, <clears throat> you know, the studio was happy with the with the box office returns mm -hmm. for a movie with no stars in it, and we yeah, were happy. Very with little that. budget too yeah. at that point. Right? Yeah, and so we, you know, Club Dread w was was greenlit, but it was a couple of years. It was the DVD market. It was people passing these the the movie around and you know, uh, watching it at parties. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a few years, we'd be walking down the street and somebody would come running out of the a bar or something like that, or somebody would just shout something at you from a, a car, and they're like, whoa, something's going on here. And it, you know, it became clear that there was sort of like a grassroots groundswell type of thing where people Definitely were- slow burn. Yeah. 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 And you guys were patient with it too, because yeah. you know, even if that movie were today and it doesn't have the initial success, people kind of forget about it, go on to the next thing. But yeah, yeah three, four, five years later, people are still talking about it. I'm yeah, sure it kind of resonated pretty with people, crazy. which is great. Yeah. yeah. And just from where you guys started at Colgate to now people are talking about your movies. Yeah. Like that's a, that's a major jump. Absolutely. Yeah, I think because that's, you know, the movies that we grew up with were those movies that you would quote. Right. You know, and that's and you that. guys wanted that as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, to, to even imagine that that could happen was mm. something that we didn't talk about. You right. know, that was just something we had done with, with your Caddyshacks and your Stripes and Fletch, you know, like that kind of thing. And so that when we saw people were doing that, that was kind of, it was a little heady thinking maybe, you know, maybe we did do something pretty good here. Yeah, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. So take me back to Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. You guys are both in that. I mean, Jessica Simpson yeah. at her peak, Sean William Scott. Yeah. So um, Willie Nelson, of course, too. Yeah. yeah. So give me give me a couple stories from then that you can still remember. Yeah, well, we, uh, we uh, uh, Jay Chandler Sekar, who you know, was our director, mm -hmm. uh, the, the executive who wanted to make Dukes of Hazzard was a big fan of Super Troopers, and he wanted to give it that feel, kind of like, you know, the Smoking the Bandit, mm -hmm. Super Troopers feel. And so he had approached a couple times, and Jay was like, no, 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 no. And then eventually he was like, you know what, if my guys can help you know, rewrite it and stuff, then, then I'll be more comfortable. So we ended up rewriting it and then acting in it. And it was great. It was a lot of fun. It was like the first time we had worked on a really major mm -hmm. budget, you know, big studio film with stars like Jessica and that, and that stuff. And then, uh, and then the beauty was that because we made that movie with them, um, they let us make beer fest. Mm. That was the kind of the trade. Is like, hey, you know, you do, do this, this, and then and then right. we got that opportunity. Which you know, beer fest was probably like the the catering budget on you know on the Dukes <laughs> of Hazzard. Dukes of Hazzard. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, but anyway, that was the great uh, opportunity. But I mean, to be in that movie with people, it was Burt Reynolds and mm. Willie Nelson and Jessica and and Johnny Knoxville and a lot of these guys we've maintained great friendships with. You yeah. know? So that was a blast to do that. Yeah, we had a great time. I did uh, Jessica Simpson's screen test. I played Enos oh, you did? for her screen <laughs> test. Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, she great. had she done a lot of acting at that point. No, no, and the studio. Not yet, right? The, yeah, yeah. But the studio was very at, like that. They were they very adamant. Her. They right. wanted her to be that part. Yeah. And we saw tons of mm. tons of people. Like everybody came in. Yeah. But she did a good job. And it was. I mean, it was fun for us because then you know we were writing the script and they had us go down to Baton Rouge mm. for constant rewrites while filming was going on, and you know. They're just, you know, there's like 80 General Lee cars there. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's a gigantic, like a 70 million dollar movie or something like yeah. that. Wow, that's yeah. a big budget. Yeah, it's a really big budget. Yeah. yeah. So you guys got to do Beer Fest as a yeah. result of that. So yeah. how does how does Beer Fest even come about? And when when you think about it now, I mean, it's again, it's a it's a, a gritty type of movie that again, something you guys wanted to make that yeah. you're able to make. So um, what do you remember most fondly about it? Beer Fest was a reaction. To what? To the negative press we got on Club Dread. <laughs> so How bad was the Club Dread press? The, the press was terrible on it. I think it was a mistake for us to do a sh such a shift, a tonal shift from, just some, some super from Super Troopers to go to a horror comedy. Mm was probably not a great move for I'm us. I'm sure you wanted to we try like something different. Yeah. Well, because yeah, we, I love that movie. When, we made, when we made Super Troopers, we've got guys chugging maple syrup and mm -hmm. then getting ill from right. it. Right. And then he's, you know, naked, covered in powdered sugar, yep. and his junk is on screen, <laughs> and he was freezing that day, <laughs> obviously. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we realized when you write stuff, you have to perform it at some point. So why don't we do something more advantageous to us, which is how Club Dread came about, we said to Fox Searchlight. Uh, you, you know, our joke was like, maybe we should put ourselves on a, on a tropical island with 100 girls in bikinis. <laughs> and they were like, no, oh, that's not a bad idea. And that's how Club Dread came mm -hmm. about. Um, but tonally, that was a little bit of a shift. Okay. And so, and also, we opened up against the Passion of the Christ. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. And so, and that's uh, a tough weekend. Yeah, it up. was tough. Oh, the Lord uh, was not in the mood to laugh that. No, weekend. he wasn't feeling that one. <laughs> no, he wanted to be front and center, and he oh, was. Man. Uh, but so, so then we got killed in the reviews. They were like, oh, whatever. It was they call it sophomoric, mm. frat boy humor, you know. And we were sort of reeling from that. Yeah. The following week, it was a devastating blow, professionally. And we were all sitting in this room, and, and uh, Kevin was like, "God, if these if they want to see something sophomore, we should do a movie called Beer Fest." <laughs> <laughs> and just blurted that name out. We we're like, "Yeah." We were laughing about it, and we we're like, "As with all our ideas, we we're like, that's actually a pretty good idea." <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are at your lowest of lows yeah. there, and you just simply we just leaned there. into it. We wow. leaned into it. That's what yeah. we did. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, we wanted to make a sports movie. It's a right. sports movie. Yeah, and you rerouted. Yeah, and uh, and then write what you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the original. Do you remember the original? The original one was that uh, the version of it was that these two guys had gone to uh, Oktoberfest, mm -hmm. gotten humiliated. And then decided they were going to destroy Oktoberfest oh, by by uh, creating a competing Oktoberfest <laughs> in the states, and their hook was, "How are they going to? How can you possibly compete with Oktoberfest? Underage drinking." Oh my goodness! <laughs> so they were going to do it on an Indian yeah, reservation. More, more irresponsible. Yeah, with underage drinking, and yeah. they were going to blow this thing out. And then we were like, "Can't do that." From a practical standpoint, yeah, that's a massive budget, and it's irresponsible. Right, right. So we dialed it back and looked at, uh, took a cue from one of our favorite films, Bloodsport, mm -hmm. uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, <laughs> and, uh, and contained it into like a, an underground type of thing. Yeah. And we were talking before, like, movies aren't being made in the same way. It seems like you guys hit at perfect times, early 2000s, mid 2000s. Yeah. Do you guys still have that bug to make movies or you focus on TV? Where are you at with everything? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, making movies is a blast, but they just don't, you know, they don't make as many of those movies anymore. And we, you know, we, we would talk to the executives at Warner Brothers mm -hmm. or whatever when we made Beer Fest, and it was like, you know, we made this movie for 13 million bucks or right. whatever like that, which is nothing compared to, you know, Superman or whatever yeah, it is they're making. Marvel yeah. movies, you and know. they said, you know, we said you could make, you know, you could make a bunch of these movies, and and then they said to us, well, we could also make one Harry Potter mm. and just make a crap load of money. Yeah. So, and that's really kind of the mindset now is right. that, you know. They're not going to make those kind of movies, really. So you have to find out, find out how to do it. I mean, TV is the way right now. Right. Where it feels you can like get there and do that. There. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'll tell you a story uh, about Beer Fest too, which is uh, after Club Dread, after Super Troopers came out, mm -hmm. uh, Adam Sandler had us come into his uh, to Happy Madison mm -hmm. as uh, for a meet and greet, and just said, "Hey, I saw your guys' movie. I think you guys are the real deal. If you ever need anything, come talk to me." Uh, after Club Dread came out and bombed, he uh, called us into his office and said. You know what? You guys need me now. Oh wow! So pitch me an idea. <clears throat> we wound up pitching in Beer Fest, and so he he brought that movie to Sony, hmm. and uh, set it up for us, and wound up actually shepherding that project, and and we developed that project with with his company. Wow. But like it was one know. of those 
times where somebody, you meet a lot of people in Hollywood who are like, hey, I'll hook you up, right. and, and they don't. Don't but he, actually do anything. But he actually did, and ultimately Sony didn't make it, and so he, he wound up not being the producer on it. But it was, uh, I think that was a cool experience for Absolutely. us. Yeah. Clooney, yeah. Sandler, a couple guys helping you out. Yeah. All right, lastly, when people check out Tacoma FD, what do you want them to enjoy the most? What do you want mm -hmm. them to walk away think? I mean, I think, you know, in talking about all the movies that we made, it's like, it's that same feel, mm -hmm. you know? It's, it's a group of guys having a good time and you can join in and it's an approachable group of guys and have fun. And I think it's the same vein of humor, a lot of the same actors, uh, you know, so you'll see a lot of familiar faces and stuff. So I think the fans of the movies are gonna love the TV show. Yeah, and I think also first responders will like it too. Uh, you know, something we've tried to do is uh, make it very clear in the series that these guys are good at their jobs. Right. Like they're not bumbling. Right. And yeah, give them some love. Yeah, you know? yeah, they're really good at their jobs, but you know, like all firehouses, you've got twenty-four hour shifts, right. and so there is downtime. There's and gonna be some shenanigans. There yeah, are yeah. shenanigans, <laughs> pranks, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, and then when you get the calls, it's not all fire calls. That right. the, and the firefighters, all of them, across the world, around the globe, like a cat in a tree. Yeah, yeah but, <laughs> but more, there's the, they have you know stories like that, but like worse ones, and mm. they have the craziest things. They get people, you know unstuck from things. They get things <laughs> unstuck out of people. Like, yeah. they see a lot of crazy stuff, and that's, that's uh, we're, we're trying to sh show those stories. Yeah, there was a kid in my high school who got his hands stuck in the outdoor cafeteria table. Had to right. have the fire department come in there. That's yeah. what they get to call. They get to, I don't know, call the fire department. <laughs> yeah. they'll, they'll get it out, yeah. I guess, you know. And it's, well, really guys, yeah. it's been an absolute pleasure. Steve, thanks, thanks. so much, Thank Kev. you, Jay. Awesome. Appreciate it. You guys can check out Tacoma FD on True TV. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.